Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Today's podcast episode is proudly sponsored by Timo, the award winning app designed to support neurodivergent people just like yourself with routine and scheduling. Head to your app store and type TIIMO to learn more. Hello, good listeners, and welcome back to another episode of the 4040 podcast, the only autism and mental health podcast that you've ever gonna you're ever gonna listen to. Best one out there by me. My name is Thomas Henley, and today we are going to be talking about autism and acting. Now, I haven't had the most brilliant of days. I had a major change to my routine today. And basically what happened was I was at work. I got sent home early because I wasn't needed. And I basically just laid in my bed until the end of time. Not the end of time, but (laughs) I, I basically just laid in bed until my work ended so that I could continue with my routine. But apart from that, feeling fresh, feeling good, got some exciting new things on the horizon. And of course, we've got this podcast, which I'm also equally excited to do. Today, I'm joined by a autistic actor from Manhattan, New York. He's a theatre performance graduate from James Madison University. He's done many, many theatre productions many of which in New York. He's also been on screen in four independent films, playing the lead in a couple of roles. Himself and his classmate Joseph are both winners. Classmate? Um, (laughs) Classmate. (laughs) You're not in school. (laughs) That went went brilliantly. (laughs) All uh, balls to the wall with this this introduction. But let's continue. (laughs) himself and his castmate Joseph are both winners of the Outstanding Ensemble category from the New York Innovative Awards. And to top all that, he's a brilliant singer and writer as well. And it's not very often that I get to introduce my guests with such a repertoire of different talents and experiences. My question is to you, Reggie, how Hmm. do you fit in time to sleep? How do I fit in time to sleep? Well, the answer, and thank you for that intro. That was that made me feel great about myself, Thomas. Thank you. Well, it you got to see it written down, said, whatever. <laughs> you need, sometimes need that positive wake up to show that show you that you're awesome. <laughs> um, the answer is right now. I'm in quarantine, so uh-huh. my sleeping opportunity at the moment is manifold and in fact i would say i have more time to sleep than not to sleep Ah, uh, okay i get your drift <laughs> so um i think we, we had a little bit of a, a chat before before um, mm-hmm. starting recording and um i was i was thinking like it's going to be really hard to be in lockdown and be in quarantine when your job is centered around being around other people and working oh God, with other yeah. people in close contact. So I, I can imagine it's been quite a tough time for you over this this isolation. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, because exactly what you just said, as an actor, invariably, even if you're shooting a film and you don't require a live audience, you still need people around you to shoot. You still need to be in close quarters. And, you know, not every film demands a mask. <laughs> yes. And then there's the other part of it which is I'm autistic. So sometimes not having to interface with people on a daily basis, my social skills get a little lax, but 
it, it, it is a little bit less pressure on me. Yeah. And so there's sort of that mix of things that there's some good, there's some bad, mostly bad, but there's a little good. Yeah. I, I completely understand that. I think that the hardest times for me during this, this sort of COVID, because we've obviously relaxed a lot of the rules and regulations for the time being until it spikes. Um, but mm. <laughs> the hardest things for me were the start of lockdown, you know, finding your feet middle yeah. bit, pretty much smooth sailing until I, I reach a bit of a mental health low. But mm-hmm. for the most part, it's it's been quite therapeutic to sort of give yourself space to to do things based on what you feel like doing. Yeah, absolutely. But anyway, uh, I forgot to give you give everybody your name, Reggie <laughs> Herald, right? Reggie Herald, yes, indeed. <laughs> Reggie Herald. I keep I keep wanting to say Reggie Harold, and I don't know why. It's not it's not Reggie Harold. <laughs> <laughs> My full name is. I think my my father was he he really wanted to impress upon everybody I met that I was indeed Caucasian. He named me Reginald Nathaniel Harold. Oh jeez. Which is just <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well my my name is Thomas William Jack Henley which is for Yorkshire standards in the UK is quite upper middle class sounding so it does it does sound like you've you've got some generational wealth behind you. Yes, it does. <laughs> May not be true, but it, it definitely <laughs> does sound like that. So, um, would you like to give everybody a little bit of a background to who you are, what you do for work, and what you do online? Absolutely. So, as Thomas just mentioned, my name is Reggie Harold. I've been an actor for quite a while. I'm 26 years old now. I also sing. A lot of my professional acting has been in film and straight theater. I've also done two musicals here in the city. Well, when I'm not acting, I usher Broadway shows because acting is a very infrequent source of income, especially in the early days, which however my resume sounds, I'm still very much an up and coming actor. And what I do online, I believe you found me through Instagram, through my TikToks. Is that right? I found you on Instagram. Yeah. I was like... Autistic actor, gotta gotta have him on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I have a little bit of a following on TikTok. I talk about a lot of things. I I started by talking about acting and being an actor. And one time, I finally made one video about me being autistic, and there was this swell of attention from other autistic people who use TikTok, and that has also boosted people following my Instagram and yeah, that is what I do online. So do do you have like a specific kind of uploading schedule or do you just get (laughs) them done and put them out whenever? That's a great question. I, sometimes I have an uploading schedule and sometimes I get very lazy. (laughs) Uh, I would say when I'm, when I'm on my game and I'm really doing it, I have a document on my phone where I write down ideas for TikToks and I workshop them and I'll post one in my really active times. I'll post one a day, maybe more than one a day. Wow. Lately, it has not been that much because I'm not working with a whole lot of material other than, you know, an upcoming election in the United States. But when I'm active, yeah, I'll, I'll do very often one a day, if not more. Could I could I be cheeky and ask for you what your follower count is? <laughs> <laughs> um, on TikTok, it's about 25,000 followers. Jeez. Thank God. <laughs> <sighs> it's, 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 it's not as many followers on TikTok as it would be on other things. It's, it's much easier to get a following on TikTok, I think, than other platforms. Still, like 25,000 people have clicked follow on you. Like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Very unexpected. Yeah. I follow this Instagram account that shares actually autistic TikTok videos. Yeah. And there just yeah, seems yeah. to be a lot of stuff on it. Yeah. They um they reached out to me on Instagram and asked if they could use some of my TikToks for their Instagram. And I said, yeah, absolutely. And oh, I so I've seen I s- you then. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was thinking. I, I assumed you must have seen me through there. I've been so amazed by the same thing, seeing how many autistic people are making these things about their autism. And it's teaching me about autism because I don't feel very often like I'm very knowledgeable about autism from, a, from an objective standpoint. Yeah. And I'm learning so much just by watching people talk about their experiences through that. <clears throat> One thing that I did want to sort of run past you, it's not part of the the, the questions, it's more of kind of a, a uh, creator to creator kind of thing. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I found about trying to be successful and, and autistic at the same time is that the very little energy that you have to socialize with people mm. is, is already quite little and it's already quite a, a task to sort of get out and do stuff. But when you have different things to do, like, you know, for, for yourself doing TikToks and, and going out and doing your acting and stuff, it's even harder to maintain your social relationships at all. Do, do you see much of that in yourself? Yeah, absolutely. One thing I remember someone saying, you know, when I walk into an audition or I walk into a rehearsal or what have you, I'm on. You know, like there's a degree of I am acting every second of that. Yes. <laughs> and I've had multiple conversations, uh, especially in my 20s now that I'm working professionally, where people who don't know me that well, they'll see me before a take or during a take, after a take, whatever. And then they'll see me again when I'm resting. And they'll say something to me akin to, I have never seen you be this quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had one person go, you know, I don't really know what your real personality is. And it's this fascinating thing where either I, you know, brush it off with a joke, which is often what I do because, you know, who has time? Or I um, try to explain that the output that acting and socializing require, to me, they're very similar outputs as it is, but the outputs they require drain the yeah. heck out of me. And then I need time to sort of just, I put in my AirPods. And I listen to music for a little while before the next take. And I don't necessarily want to be talking to my castmates, not because I don't like them, but just because I need that for myself. Yeah. And I think that that's, it's quite important to kind of give yourself that space and that time. It is interesting that, that you say that because um, one, one of the reasons why I thought our podcast could be really good and really interesting is a lot of people equate masking with, mm. with acting. So you're masking as a neurotypical yeah. person. You're you're doing all of these things that neurotypical people do, and it's ingrained in you, and you're an expert at it. But it takes a lot of energy, mm. and yeah. I thought that kind of dynamic is is quite interesting to kind of explore. Yeah. I I, I completely understand <laughs> switching on and off. Like people who meet me at like a networking event or mm. something that I planned. I am so much better at talking and more engaging and all of that stuff. But as per if they were just to meet me on the street where I'd be like, hi. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny that you bring up masking. I, you know, I only learned the phrase masking this year and I learned it through TikTok. There's another uh, wonderful autistic uh, TikToker whose following is much larger than mine. Her name, I believe, is Paige uh -huh. Lale. And she started talking about masking. And I went, oh, my God, <laughs> that's what I've been doing my entire life. I, I, even, I even had all these thoughts already about the fact that study and my practice of acting is basically how mm -hmm. I socialize. But to hear that there's a word for it that people who are autistic use, I went, oh, my God, <laughs> that's incredible. Well, it's definitely a, it's a very complex term because it's not, it's hard, it's really hard to define. Like for, throughout my time talking to people over podcasts and over Instagram and, and all that kind of stuff, my position on masking has kind of changed a little bit. I see mm -hmm. it as very harmful to do on a constant basis with mm. every single person in your life. But for people yes. like in job interviews or when you're first meeting people, sometimes 
masking is that language that allows you to connect with someone. But it's just, yeah. you know, when you chronically do it and you think that your personality is tied into this supreme social monster, then it's, <laughs> it can be quite difficult. Yeah. For <laughs> yes, I totally agree. Absolutely. Would you like to tell us about your autism story? When were you diagnosed and sure. what kind of effect did it have on your life? Mm-hmm. My father, who, by the way, this is just a little bit of a tangent, but my father uh, is single and he was single when he adopted me and my brother. Oh. I believe he was the second man in the United States to ever adopt two children on his own. Wow. I have an older brother who was, I guess, five and some change when I was adopted. My brother is is a very sort of precocious and outgoing social mm-hmm. person, just just naturally. And my dad noticed very early, like early enough that the story is about him holding me when he noticed that just something was weird. And there was stuff about, you know, he couldn't lean back too far in a chair. Otherwise I would go ballistic. There was, I, you know, I wouldn't touch certain materials. There was all kinds of stuff. And my dad took me around to a lot of doctors and basically what they told him was like, it's, he's too young. We have no idea. Or I believe a lot of doctors basically just said, there's nothing serious going on here. He's just a baby until one doctor, I believe I apparently just started going ballistic over nothing in front of a doctor. And the doctor finally went, okay, something's going on. And I don't know how that progressed specifically to an autism diagnosis. I know uh, via story that my father had me tested for a lot of different Mm -hmm. stuff. I know that I went through IQ tests. I know that there's one test in particular that I was put through where they would take my favorite toy. They would like put it at the bottom of a box and then they would fill the box with materials. And if the material was too rough, I would touch the material and then I wouldn't go for the toy and I wouldn't even care. And so there was tactile stuff that they picked up on. So my dad had a diagnosis for me very early. I didn't know that I was autistic until I was about 12. Nobody told me. I was actually, at the time, I had just gotten into, um, at 12 years old, I had gotten into a school for the gifted. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was, I had no business being there. (laughs) 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 Apparently, I had gotten in by dint of the IQ tests, but not necessarily by dint of any particular academic excellence that I'd shown. But I had started going to school and my dad set me up with a social worker. And I was curious, obviously, why I was working with this woman. And finally, I remember she and my dad took me out to ice cream one day. She would take me out to ice cream like every week. It was awesome. And they told me I was autistic. At the time... I didn't really know what that meant. I had some idea that it was something to do with maybe executive function. I didn't know. They, they explained it to me and I was busy eating my mint chip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how I found out. And I think, you know, the ways it's shaped my life, I, you know, had to work with social workers as a kid. My social skills, as with many autistic people, developed quite late. And I would say in many ways, I'm still developing them. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a huge question, but that's how I found out. I'm so like, I'm in awe of your father. <laughs> Honestly, like that is amazing. That's really interesting. Cause I, I was diagnosed when I was 10. Mm. When I was diagnosed, my, my parents told me, and it was quite, it's quite a big thing because I, I'd noticed just how strange other people were. And it was, yeah. it was kind of, it's it's a weird thing to describe, but you just feel like everything about the world and other people is just off. And they sort of yeah. work on a different wavelength. Yeah, feel a little bit like an alien. Yeah, yeah, from <laughs> outer space. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, it was quite a, an important moment for me in, in my childhood. It's one of the things that I remember quite vividly. Was that positive for you? I mean, what was your experience of that? It was it was positive for me because it it gave me a reason for things that were happening around me that you know I, I probably wouldn't have expressed because you know my social skills were a bit rubbish at the time mm-hmm. and I didn't wasn't very <laughs> in tune with my emotions. And it's only until 
I got I got to university that I seriously started um, reading about autism and all the kind of aspects of it and listening to people. For the most of mm-hmm. my teenagehood, it was mostly a battle with mental health for, yeah. for a long, long time. Absolutely. I see a lot of um, similarities, but the, the weird thing about the autistic community is it makes you feel less special, but it makes you feel less mm-hmm. alone <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only Absolutely. thing. That's a kicker. <laughs> you, you, feel, you feel like an alien. My experience of it is you feel like an alien, but it makes you, f- ma- it made me feel often, <laughs> it sounds so narcissistic, it made me feel a little bit special. Yeah. A little bit like, yeah, you know who else was autistic? Einstein. So come at me. There's so many people, you know, could, could and have been confirmed. Footballers yeah. and artists and musicians and scientists, politicians, mm-hmm. that, 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 that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that's, it's really, really cool to hear about that. Yeah. Today, we're going to be talking about your acting and sort of drawing mm-hmm. on the different aspects to it, maybe linking it in, as I said, with masking and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So let's start from the beginning. How did you mm-hmm. get into acting and why? Sure. I wanted to be an actor very young. Before I had really started studying it properly or taking it seriously as an art form, I think the real reason I wanted to do it when I was young is because it seemed fun and it seemed easy. Mm-hmm. To me, uh, quote unquote, real people jobs seemed quite complicated. And to me, acting was just, oh, I can pretend to be somebody else. I do that <laughs> all the time. And yeah, I I wanted to be an actor. I, I remember being 10 years old and we were doing Beauty and the Beast at my elementary school. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, it, it was the silliest it was Beauty and the Beast Jr. So there were like extra characters and the dialogue was yeah. dumb. <laughs> um, but I was one of Belle's brothers, William. And I remember there were two other brothers. And I remember very vividly in our opening scene, we walked onto this couch and the two brothers were bickering about something. And there was a space. And then I went, you two are so immature and the audience would lose it every single night. And I, (laughs) I loved that. I loved that instant feedback. I loved, I mean, one could say the attention, but genuinely I loved that sort of, I I loved hearing people laugh and feel joy just based on a sentence. Yeah. I thought, I thought like, I, you know, I couldn't break it down at the time, but there was just something incredibly uplifting about that. Like, and I think from that moment on, I wanted to be an actor. I think with with, with some autistic people, like like myself, and possibly possibly like yourself, there there is that need to sometimes that need for attention. I guess because mm-hmm. if you if you spend your your days struggling and you spend your days being ignored by people and being picked on and isolated and not really getting on with people then yeah. any sort of sense of positive social interaction, no matter how detached, <laughs> is quite you, helpful. It, it, for, for me, For me, podcasting and doing YouTube and stuff is quite a big thing for me because it sort of keep, keeps me going, keeps me being able to, to tell my story. Mm-hmm. There was very much a time in my life when I was about 14 or 15 I was I was in the car and I was going to one of my taekwondo classes and I was I was I was reaching breaking point at that point I was I was very severely depressed and you know all all of the type of things that come along with that and I sort of made a wager with myself I was like tell you what Tom stay around and at some point in your life you're going to have the ability to talk about just the, the the extent of you know what you've been through and that was quite an alluring thing, and it's, it's it's kept me kept me going. Sure, things have changed, and now my goal is to is to make a difference. But it was it was very powerful for me. Yeah, I think that's great. I think I love, and I I said this to you before we started recording, but I love that you're doing this. I love that you're providing a resource for people, and I'm sure that there's you know an autistic kid who's going to find this and not necessarily feel totally isolated. Mm. One of the 
beauties of the internet is that it provides platforms like that. Yeah. I don't think there's there's enough spaces for like a lot a lot of the, the media around autism is educational or it's it's very short and it's it's emotional and it's and it's all that, but it's never just autistic people chatting to each other about stuff. Like you, <laughs> you never get that sense of normality in it. It's always like you get your one chance in the spotlight doing something really cool and amazing and everyone can awe at you and you know just how much you've you've been through but it's you know there's not much Mm -hmm. of autistic people on talk shows talking about what they want and what they think the government's doing wrong and and all that kind of stuff (laughs) yeah i think it's one of the unfortunate things about this particular uh neurodivergency that yeah one thing a lot of us are quite bad at (laughs) Mm -hmm. is talking to other people (laughs) yeah exactly well you got to have some people to do it. I am definitely not naturally socially competent. I learned all of this on, on my own and so sort of pra- practice and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you got to take one for the team, don't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's ama- it's amazing that you, you, you're doing acting and stuff because obviously it's, it's going to be quite interaction intense for you. Mm-hmm. Like how, do yeah. you how do you cope with, with that? Have you... Got any like strategies mm-hmm. that you use to get around stuff? Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, you're right. I would say my firmest strategy in this, uh, this sounds quite cliche and maybe a bit obvious, but it's literally just, it's, it is always being so prepared for whatever I'm walking into mm-hmm. as much as I can be. I think one of the things about autistic people and this is i think stereotyped quite a bit but it's it's also true is the point that autistic people we tend to fixate yeah. on certain things or topics mm-hmm. and there's a degree to which that's been a tool for me because i have read every acting book under the sun i have listened to countless interviews with other actors i never get bored with it the answer is to mediating the kind of anxiety within myself and that burnout Mm -hmm. is just being as prepared as I can be literally just being on my craft and on my technique. And when I walk in knowing that I know what I'm going to do and I know how to do it and that helps me mediate my anxiety, it's not always perfect. So you've got quite a a stoic attitude to um, (laughs) facing anxiety. (laughs) I can I can have a bit of a stoic attitude towards it. Yeah, well, that's good. That's you know like some of, some of life's most difficult things and, and problems and stuff can always be helped by a bit of a bit of stoicism. Yeah, weighed off that ni- nihilistic viewpoint. <laughs> <laughs> it does creep in with me now and again. You know that kind of uh, <laughs> what's the point? Like society is a, is a fraud, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, stoicism always pulls that's- through. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the interesting thing about it too is the job I have as an actor is so anti-stoic. Mm-hmm. It's 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 because you have to be so emotionally available. You have to be so loose, and you know it, it doesn't matter if I'm feeling anxiety if my character isn't feeling anxiety. Yeah. So I just have to constantly navigate that as an actor, and it's 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 an interesting challenge, and it's. I don't know that it's one I'm ever going to get bored of. <laughs> like, yeah, like I, I've been in situations where I've I've had like live radio shows that I've been on. Those have been fine, but like as soon as you get me in front of a camera, it just adds a new level of difficulty because you gotta you gotta work on your facial expressions and your body language. You can't just yeah. work on your tonality. You can't just work on your voice and your tonality and all of that. You gotta. Pay attention to lots of different things and make eye contact and yeah and and I suppose in your case you know manage the anxiety around it which um it's amazing that you you know you've you've chosen to kind of push through that and and see where it takes you so it's a very rewarding challenge especially when you pull it off like really pull it off okay so we talked a, a little bit about kind of your, your struggles and and stuff like that do you think that You've you've ever been discriminated against, or you haven't been given the proper support? Hmm. I would say I don't feel that I'm discriminated discriminated against. I think one of the good things about 
acting and sort of the way the business of acting is conducted is a lot of it happens in short bursts anyway. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're doing a film, they set up for a shot and then basically you're working intensively for 30 to 45 minutes, Mm -hmm. maybe longer, depending on how complicated the shot is. But then, you know, you have a ton of downtime while they set up the next shot and you might not have to do anything else for another three hours. Theater too, you know, you have time off stage, and the way rehearsals are conducted, in general, you work for about two hours and there's a break. I would say in terms of discrimination, I don't really feel that I'm discriminated against because most people don't know I'm autistic until I bring it up. I think I pass as being very neurotypical and people are often quite surprised. Yeah when they find out that I'm autistic, which is, you know, that's, there's a double-edged sword to that too. (laughs) But yeah, I I don't feel that I'm discriminated against. I think in terms of that, I think the business is actually quite forgiving. So no, no quarrels with your acting coaches? Not about my autism. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, those, I, I think when I have disputes with acting coaches or, what have you, most of those are either situational or personality-based. Yeah. I certainly have had acting coaches who I didn't like, who I felt were abusive, but it's never been about my autism. Well, that's, that's, that's great to hear. Like, it sounds like it's, it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. So it's time for a quick mention from our sponsors, Timo. If you love visual support in your scheduling, Timo is for you. The app was designed for people with ADHD and autism and helps empower users to schedule visual routines that work. Users say that Timo can help reduce stress and support executive function, which are both two things that I struggle with myself. Learn more at www. Timoapp.com, or just type in T-I-I-M-O into your search bar. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Your support means the world. Anyway, let's get back into the show. One of the questions that I wanted to ask, which I think is a very interesting one, considering we've talked about masking, mm-hmm. would it be easier to play an autistic person or a neurotypical <sighs> Because you've had all that experience yeah, acting like a, like a neurotypical on camera, but yeah. could you act autistic on camera? <laughs> Interesting. It's That's a really good question, Thomas. Um, okay. So the way I'll, I'll answer it is this, and I, I have to get a little bit technical, but I'll try not to be too actory when I answer <laughs> this question. <laughs> too, much, too many jargons. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's there's too much stuff. I can't be like, yeah, so my objective would nah, it wouldn't make sense. Um, but I would say if I were to take a role as an autistic person, and I'll preface that by saying I probably will never be offered a role as an autistic person. Why not? Unfortunately, a lot of, well, it's a lot of the, and I actually have, uh, I have a tangent that I can go on in a second about that, okay. but I have a tangent on this tangent. A lot of autistic roles, the, the stereotype in the media is of sort of a small, I'm going to say white, I am white, but a small, white, frail kid who isn't able to make eye contact with anybody. And if you don't look like that, generally autistic roles are not for you. I can think of three roles Um, that are really good, that are autistic characters in film and TV. And those are, these are all TV, actually. Uh, Sheldon in The Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. I think his name is Elliot in Mr. Robot, the main character. I haven't seen that. And you haven't seen it? It's great. It's great. It's, he's very intense. He has, yeah, but he's, I I don't remember if they've ever said that he's autistic, but he's clearly autistic. And then Atypical the TV show Atypical. And all three of those actors sort of are within that vein. Mm -hmm. The people that they go 
that film crew and producers go for when they want an autistic person. Mm-hmm. I think I think that there's maybe even a, a script decision there where you want somebody who looks smaller so that people can sympathize with it. I have no idea. Autism on screen very often looks like nerdy and unsociable, mm-hmm. even when it's handled really well. And I generally play characters who are very outgoing. Yeah. And I play characters who are actually kind of laissez-faire and they're very sociable, even if they're not very smart. Those are a lot of characters I play. And also because I'm a little more athletic looking because I work out quite a bit, those roles aren't available to me, which is, it's a shame to me. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of tangents. No, no, it's it's really uh, interesting. Please continue. It's very late. I started writing, when I was in college, a solo play called This is Purple. And it was a story about how when I was 12, and I was at this school for the gifted, I ended up leaving this school, a teacher abused me. Oh, physically. God. Oh, yeah, I'm so it was, sorry. It was, and I, I, it's okay. I mean, I mean it, you know, it's not okay, but it happened. <laughs> yeah. um, so the story is essentially that I was not doing very well at this school, um, not because I couldn't mentally keep up with it, but there was a lot of work being thrown at me and I was suddenly very out of my league and my rhythms were being thrown off and I wasn't doing my homework. I just stopped. And this teacher got it in her head that I was not doing my homework to get her in trouble with my dad. Right. Because my dad and the social worker would get on her when I didn't, when I got bad grades or whatever. And I, I got screamed out in front of the class and then I got dragged out into the hallway and thrown into a locker. Into a locker. Not, not literally, the oh, locker right, was okay, closed, okay. but okay. into, yeah, mm-hmm. smacked against a locker and screamed out some more. And then after that, I transferred out of the school and went to a different school. At that place was a much more understanding teacher who I had this system set up with where whenever I felt something start to freak me out, I would just use a code phrase, this is purple. So I started writing the solo play and it's sort of an anatomy of that moment. Mm. And the reason I started writing it specifically was because I wanted to see autistic people who looked like me. Yeah. And there are not many of them. No, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stereotypes and I think, you know, unless in, in, in the the face of autism, the, the the stereotype of autism changes, you know, like like you mm-hmm. said, like acting roles and, and gigs and stuff like that are gonna go to mm-hmm. specific people who look a certain way, which is just mm-hmm. completely counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the T V series Hannibal? I have, yeah. The main character in that, he's he's um, Asperger's. Yeah, I, I, I remember there's a line at the beginning of that. I think he even says, my wagon is hitched much, much closer to autistics than like schizophrenics or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do remember that now that you're mentioning it. And that's, it, it, it is sort of in my point there as well. You know, you have, he's, he's a very good looking man, whatever his name is, I don't remember. I don't remember but, either. Yeah, but he, he too, he's sort of a small framed, you know, he's got rimmed glasses. He's, he comes off as very quiet and he's a super genius who doesn't know how to socialize. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be a prevalent stereotype. I do, I do know autistic people who are like him, you know, they're, they're very mm-hmm. withdrawn, but very empathetic and, and able to, to analyze things in, in a very high degree. But part of the reason why I like it is because it's not about autism. It's a film, but yes, the main character is autistic, but it's not about autism, which is absolutely absolutely awesome, and I love that. Which is partly one of the reasons yeah. why I haven't watched Atypical because I feel <laughs> like anything about autism is just gonna like emotionally trigger me to some degree, which oh god, is not yeah. something that you want to relax to. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will say I love Hannibal. I think it's a great show. And I would say if you find yourself emotionally ready 
to watch Atypical, I would recommend it. I think it is the most human look at autism that I've seen. And also, it doesn't just examine him, it examines his family mm. and the impact and the way they handle his autism. Mm. I watched it with my dad and we, it provoked a lot of interesting discussions. It's also hard to watch for me without bawling. Yeah, I can imagine. Because I understand. You know, I'll, I'll, see if, I'll see if my girlfriend wants to, uh, wants to watch it. We we did watch Love on the Spectrum together, which was surprisingly yeah. quite nice in so, in some respects. I did like a a little video over on that over on YouTube. But it's it's definitely an interesting thing the kind of the dynamic between stereotypes and and movies and stuff, and now it's kind of like a self perpetuating loop. Mm. You know, the stereotypes come from sort of public knowledge. Or general public knowledge, and then those affect what kind of people that they include in autism movies, and it kind of spirals and <laughs> mm. <laughs> interesting. To oh, Thomas, about. I just realized I didn't answer your question. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's all right. Okay, it happens it a lot, is. you know. I, f- follow the train yeah, of thought wherever I, I can, it goes. <laughs> I can I can do it really succinctly. Okay, right? go for it. So I would say a non autistic person would be easier to play than an autistic person. And the reason that is, is because if I were to play an autistic person, I wouldn't approach that by drawing on Reggie's autism. Yeah, I would be wanting to look objectively at how it affects this character and how that correlates with the sort of broader scientific understanding of autism. Mm. So the answer is neurotypical is easier than autistic from my perspective as a trained actor. It's very interesting to hear that. I was, ex- I, I think, when I was writing these, I was definitely expecting a different answer, but it makes sense. It does because I suppose if you spend all that time trying to play roles that are neurotypical, then it's kind of like your default <laughs> acting role. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. It, it's difficult in the industry, and you kind of have to know people and stuff. But I would definitely like to see more autistic leads in films so if you if you go for it go for it and you know pitch to some people about being autistic and stuff then oh i'm doing my best to write that stuff i (laughs) promise (laughs) well hopefully hopefully my work and and going on the media and stuff and and talking about on tv hopefully we can change the stereotype and we can we can get you some acting stuff sounding like i'm I'm a director myself don't i very egotistic (laughs) no but i mean I mean, it, it is ultimately it is up to us. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're the we're the up and coming generation of artists. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're a documentarian. You're doing this podcast. It really is up to people who are our age and autistic people who are our age to engage in that because otherwise, neurotypical people who maybe don't understand what we go through will sort of treat it as commodity as like a fun twist like and this character is autistic Mm. and i think it's going to be up to autistic people to create the work that genuinely shows what the human experience of autism is yeah it's it is a group effort and i think the more that we talk about it and the more that we have different people's autistic people going into different roles and as i said of i'm going to interview a romani I think Gyp- Gypsy, that's what she likes to call herself. Mm-hmm. I've got an MMA fighter coming to talk. Oh, wow. Yeah, autistic MMA fighter. I'll, I'll send you a, a link to his, his profile. Like. That's and then you've amazing. got people like yourself doing acting and people who go into the media, like my friend Nick, and so many different areas. And as, as much as we can get autistic people in a good state of mental health to build up their positive mi- image, give them role models get things seen in the mainstream, the more that we're going to make progress with it. It's just, it's a slow burner. It's a slow burner. Mm-hmm. It's, it's torturous. <laughs> There's lots of things that we need to, to build upon, but time is slow. Time is very slow. Yes, it is. So there is one more question that I wanted to ask before we sort of mm-hmm. try and round things up. Because of the nature of acting, do you think that your acting classes have benefited your social life? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, a thousand percent. I think 
there are so many layers to why, you know, being an actor and being in the world of actors and studying acting has helped me. I would say, you know, there's what we've glanced on a little bit, which is acting and masking are very interrelated processes and outputs. And there's also, I know a lot of people in this business and a lot of people in this business know me because they've seen me in class, they've seen me in auditions, they've done shows with me. And as a result, I have, in fact, always had, I mean, since I started taking it seriously when I was about 15 or 16, a social network of people who do what I do, who love many of the things that I love. And there's a lot you can say about actors. And there are many actors who are quite superficial, of course, as there are just people who are not actors. But actors, I think many of the best ones are deeply empathetic creatures. Mm -hmm. And I, I have faced judgment for many things. I have never faced judgment for being autistic. When I tell people that I'm autistic, especially when I was younger and wasn't quite as well socially adjusted, I would get just acceptance and love and warmth. The answer is yes. I think, I don't know, the, I don't remember that that was a yes or no question, but I, I do believe that being an actor has had a massive positive impact on my social life in a way that I don't know if I could have had quite the same experience doing anything else. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot to say for that. Mm-hmm. I think that <laughs> social skills and life skills are learnt in or around your special interest. You know, for me, it was Taekwondo and that obviously having to, you know, go to classes and training mm. on, on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. That led to, to a lot of talking with people. And once I built my reputation up, um, I'd start mm. talking to people at competitions who are from different clubs and talking to other fighters. And it was definitely a massive social network for me to learn those skills and to sort of feel comfortable in that in that social environment. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a lot to say for, as I've said, doing something that is your special interest. Like if you, if you have a special interest and you can find a job that fits that well, you are set. You have that extreme hyper-focus concentration. You want to work on it all the time and you'll have to try and wrangle yourself in to stop. It's, it's very much an important thing, but there's many people out there who are, undiagnosed autistic and are trying to live the life of a neurotypical and not live the life of an autistic person you know it's 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 the reality yeah Yeah. it's it's great to to hear that you you know you have had that sort of upbringing in in that sense it's very very invaluable yeah as you're saying i think it's so important I think it's important for every person, Mm -hmm. autistic or not, to find what they're passionate about. But I think especially for an autistic person to find what that thing is that you love and you can go to classes for it. You can build a social network around it. You can have something that brings you joy. And I think, again, I think that's important for neurotypicals as well, but I think particularly for neurodivergent people, it can be a path to a fulfilling social life as well as I think there's, there's, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, career, potentially. That is all of the questions that I wanted to ask you, apart from our little roundup questions, which is always the most fun because it's a, it's a memory recall task. <laughs> And then straight after a very, very open question that can be answered in any way. So <laughs> t- to be honest, I should probably kind of work on that. Like <laughs> considering that it's a podcast for, all, you know, made by an autistic person having <laughs> autistic guests on. I probably didn't like put many adjustments in for that, but it just seems to work, you know. But Yeah, no, I thought those questions were great. And I think I don't know many autistic actors, but I'm sure the ones I do know when they hear this will agree that these are the kinds of questions they would want to be asked. Awesome. That makes me happy to hear. In terms of being an autistic actor. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's been awesome to have this chat with you. Let's get into the memory recall task. What 
three okay. main things do you want people to take away from this podcast? <sighs> three main things. Things you want to drive okay. home. Mm -hmm. Autism doesn't just present one way, I think, is one thing I want to drive home. I think we get stereotypes in our head of what autistic people are like and what they enjoy doing or how they talk, what they look like, whatever. And the truth is that autistic people, while manifesting certain specific neurodivergencies, are as diverse. I'm going to go with diverse. I think, yes, autistic people are as diverse as neurotypicals in terms of their presentation and in terms of their personality. Did you get distracted by um, the person in the background? I, I did. <laughs> my roommate, my roommate walked out of her room and I went, Oh no. Yeah. That happens. To uh, me after about yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing I want to impress, and we just finished talking about this, but I think it is so important for autistic people to find things that they're passionate about. And if they can turn them into a career, do it. And if you can't, you know, you can have a craft on the side while you go to your day job and it will enliven you. And it, there's a good chance it'll enrich your social life. And then my third thing, memory recall. What have we talked about, Thomas? <laughs> I have no idea. I leave this up to the guests. <laughs> That's why I'm terrible. <laughs> That's why I ask you and I don't round it up for everybody because I'm terrible at it. Oh, yeah. It must be great being an interviewer. You only have to prepare. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll edit in some, uh, some audio of me mm -hmm. talking once I've listened to the entirety of it again. Sounds perfect. <laughs> I won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go for this. I would say... The arts are not off limits for autistic people. And I think that's a big thing because of how much it demands from autistic people specifically, especially if you're a performing artist. There are absolutely ways to do it and be autistic and be, you know, somewhat successful doing it and being good at it and enjoying your life while you do it. It certainly takes work. And I would say it takes more work than it would for the average neurotypical. But autistic people are given gifts that I think a lot of neurotypical people don't have. We have that ability, like you mentioned, we can focus forever on issues until they're solved. I think there's, a, there's an Einstein quote that I love, which is, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but... It's not that I'm that much smarter than everybody else. It's that I stick with problems longer. Mm. And especially given that we know he was autistic, I think that is an incredible tool and skill that autistic people have. That if we, if we become super involved with, I don't know, computer science, there is a good bet that we are going to be the most knowledgeable person you know about computer science. And if you are looking for a job in that area, you're going to be one of the best prepared people to do that thing. In some ways, autism is a little bit of a superpower. And, you know, while still acknowledging the setbacks that come with it, I think there is room to have a really positive outlook as an autistic person towards your autism. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Of course. I definitely do think that you know, autism brings a lot to every single area of life. Just, to, just as a baseline, we have a different way of being and, and behaving and thinking that is always welcome in the, in the pool of, of diversity for any sort of field. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, it, it's, it's also important to highlight that you know, even if your diagnosis says that you are not very sociable and you don't, you can't cope well with change and stress, you still can do it. It's just it's going to take more effort on your part. It's like look, look, look at me. Absolutely. Like I hardly ever used to talk to anyone at all 
I didn't work on myself. I didn't work on any of that stuff. Got to university, worked on my dating skills and my ability to make friends. I started going to parties. I went abroad to do traveling, which required a lot of change on a constant basis. And now I'm talking to people over the internet and making podcasts out of it. Like, yeah, that's, and that's exactly <laughs> it. There's so much potential in every person listening to this. It's just whether you believe in yourself and you want to go for it and you're willing to put the work in. 100%. Especially in fields like acting, like yourself, Reggie, you, you'll bring a, a, your own sort of quirk, quirk and, and difference and intrigue about your acting career. Because as you said, not a lot of autistic people are actors, or at least as far as we know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> far as they know johnny depp maybe oh one one does wonder there's a lot of wonders isn't there especially with celebrities nobody wants mm-hmm. to come out and say i'm autistic but absolutely i feel like i've said absolutely about 300 <laughs> times during this interview i just really agree with you man thank you very much it's nice <laughs> it's nice to um be agreed with <laughs> <laughs> so we've got the last question which as i said is an open question mm-hmm. What does autism mean to you, Reggie? Literally the first word that came to my head was superpower. Of course, being autistic has created difficulties in my life, especially when I was younger. But as I have adapted to some of the more difficult parts of my neurodivergence, I think the positive aspects have come through and I am just forced by dint of how my brain works to have a different outlook on things and to stay with problems longer, as Einstein said. As a working adult, as an artist, as an actor, as a writer, I can only think of those things as a superpower. And given the tools available to help with the more negative aspects of autism, I think an autistic adult has plenty of room to feel empowered by their autism rather than crippled by it. That's what autism means to me. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. It's, also, it's always nice to hear a new angle on autism. Everyone says something different. Autism means different things to different people. But the most important thing is that we show that. Like Some people hate aut- their autism and they see it as a challenge and something to have come. Some people see it as a little bit of a nuisance but not really part of their personality. You know, there's so many different... It means so much, so, so many different things to so many different people. It's just... it's crazy to hear you know a new a new approach on it every every time i do one of these podcasts Mm -hmm. i'm definitely at some point going to do like a little compilation of what autism means to to certain people i'm gonna try and like put some nice back backing music to it and do something with it at some point (laughs) but cool thank you very much for that reggie of course would you like to give out any links to your website and you know, like you TikTok and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. So my website is reggieherald.com. That's R-E-G-G-I-E-H-E-R-O-L-D.com. And you can also find me on Instagram, at Reggie Herald, again. And you can find me on all of those platforms. And especially if you're an autistic person, if you ever want to message me about autism, especially how it interrelates with art and with acting say you're moving in the city and you're an autistic actor i'd love to get coffee or something awesome well you might have a lot of requests <laughs> considering how absolutely handsome you are like god like look at your your website is so amazing i'm so jealous of your website you've got some awesome photo shoots you look you look like an absolute model you might regret putting that out to people <laughs> <gasps> Making me blush, man. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's been a lovely episode. And if you want to check out this episode and many more, you can always find it under the 40 Oti podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube under Asperger's Growth, of course. If you want to stay in tune with my day-to-day, see the kind of media things that I'm doing on the side, a little bit into my daily life, you can always find my stuff on at Asperger's Growth, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Very easy to find. And of course, if you have your own story, experience, 
opinion to share, please email me at aspergesgrowth at gmail.com. Wow, that was the first, that was like the perfect tag. I usually have to redo that a few times. That was smooth as hell, man. I'm getting all right at it. <laughs> it's only been like 26 episodes, 25 or... <laughs> <laughs> Catch the wave and it's perfect, yeah. Have you got any parting words for us, Reggie? <laughs> because I'm terrible I'd at outros. Say, oh, God, yeah. Um, your autism is a superpower. That's it. Fight those enemies. Fight those those Hell yeah. anti-vaxxers. Fight people, but always remember oh, to have yeah. a soft spot for people and stay generally kind and polite and make sure that you're emotionally in tune with yourself and others around you. Drink your water, stay clean, have a shower. And and don't vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> Little p- political um, <laughs> alignment coming in there, but we'll leave it in anyway. See you later, folks. All right. Bye. Good afternoon, loyal listeners of the Forty Orty podcast. I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a teaser to what may be coming in the new year. As you know, the Forty Orty podcast has been going on for a while now. We've had a lot of episodes rolling out, a lot of episodes, good episodes, fresh ear candy for yourselves. And with the support from Timo via the advertisements and also my Patreon supporters, and most specifically, Mr. Patrick Vedi, I have amassed enough money to upgrade my equipment. Cool, right? Well, sadly, you'll have to put up with my old shabby snowball microphone for the time being, but when the new season, season two of the 40 Audio Podcast comes out, you will be pleasantly surprised by the audio quality, which I've heard it here, right on the microphone here, it's uh, <laughs> it's going to be good quality microphones. The Rode Podcaster. Nice and fresh, new, ready for a new season. Going to be great. We're going to end on a banger. Yeah. Exciting stuff. <laughs>